this time period. Yes. Not today, but in the period. No, in the current chapter. No, 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 not quite. Not quite today, Savannah. Oh my goodness. De Tocqueville? For sure they do. Alexis? I have a friend named Alexis. Okay, who would like to read the quote? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> okay, thank you. No other country in the world is love, the love of property sooner or more with spur than in the United States. And nowhere else does this liberty display less inclination for a doctrine which is in any way threatened by property is ours. Aha! What do you think he means here? Americans are special. Americans are special. Could be. We're greedy about man. He what? We're greedy about man. Oh, greedy about land. Okay. Let's And nowhere else does the majority display less inclination toward doctrines, which in any way threaten. So if you're inclined toward doctrines, you would use doctrines. So he's saying here the majority display less inclination toward doctrines, which in any way threaten the way property is owned. Ah, oh, unless it's relating to Native Americans. So what does that mean? As long as it's not there, it's a religion. Ah, allowed us to take our their land? Okay. There are a lot of things that you can read into this into this quote, right? But what's important is that this person who comes from outside of the United States, he's talking about the love of property, okay, the love of land, all right? And this relates not just to this time period, but think about relating to um, the time period of today and land today in Alaska, especially. Has land been decided, has land ownership been decided in Alaska today? No, no, not like that. That would be correct. Not a. Why not? Because the federal government process the natives and everybody else in it. Okay. All right. Uh, you basically hit it, Brian. Very good. It. Uh, we're gonna continue to talk about it, but we will study it with Anxa and Anilka. But love of property, it's just such a fascinating quote um, from a man who historians say really pegs the society of this time period. Okay. Any questions? Okay, no Morgan. So we'll start with chapter nine. Okay, chapter nine, always a fun chapter. We get to talk about Lowell. Anybody been to Lowell, Massachusetts? Taylor, how about you? Taylor hasn't. Robin, did you say something? Yeah, I said I have. I was like 11 or 12, though. Okay, so you've been to Lowell. So what did you do in Lowell? I really don't remember much. Okay. We walked around, we looked at a lot of old, around, looked at a lot of old buildings, mm -hmm. and the grandparents were like my parents' time. They were really into everything. Awesome. I was 11. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yes. 
Uh, it's a it's a pretty fascinating place to visit. They have a what they call a cultural history national park in Lowell, and so it's it's just a, a really neat place that you can explore. It's outside of Boston. Oh, I don't know how far. Nothing seems to be further than like an hour or two from Boston in in the things that we've been studying. I mean, you can get further out west, but uh, it's pretty, everything is pretty centralized, what we really talk about. Okay, so the sweep west. You have the old northwest and the old southwest. Where's the old northwest? Ohio, Illinois. Illinois? How about Illinois? <laughs> yeah, Ohio, up around Michigan. Um, basically, west of the Appalachians, like the northern half west of the Appalachians that America said. Mm -hmm. So, or where Michigan was settled. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, in 1790, the majority of people lived where in America? Belvis. Thank you, Brian. Um, that's one place that they lived, but if you, we talk about a region, where did most people live? Probably the East Coast. They did. They lived east of the Appalachians. Okay? So about four million people that lived. in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah lived east of the Appalachians, okay, by, in 1790. By 1840, about a third of them lived between the Appalachians and the Mississippi River. Okay, think of the, the you think about mass migrations, okay, and mass immigrations, think of that migration west of the Appalachians. Yeah, about 17 million by this time, by 1840. There were only about 4 million people in America in 1790. That, okay? So the, the increase in population is dramatic, and the fact that about 17 million people had moved west of the Appalachians. Okay, but who owned the land there? Ah, they had owned the land. Right? Well, and, and there was a, there was a, not an argument, but they definitely had some conflicts about who did own the land, right? And who could claim the land and where could, people could go. So most of the people desired a better life than what they had had. Okay. Is that uncommon from today? I hear a no. You think it's pretty common worldwide? Yeah. Look at all the refugees. Look at the Syrian refugees today. Right? What about the Syrian refugees today? One of the students happened to bring candy today, so I'm stealing some candy. Huh? Yeah, one, uh, one or two of the students here should have bring food. <laughs> I don't get none of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. You, sh you should be sitting here in the classroom <laughs> with them as they eat their lunch. I had a phone call, so I missed what you were asking about the Syrian refugees. I watched a lot about, about that. I was making a an analogy between the Syrian refugees today and the fact that most of the people who were moving out west really wanted a better life. Okay, that was one of the main reasons that they kept moving west. They wanted a better life than they, that they had in the east. There was more land. They could potentially grow better crops, more bountiful crops. Okay? So... 
Like, I see the people that were moving west, I get, they, they got treated a heck of a lot better than the Syrian refugees are being treated right now. Ah, yes. But the Syrian yeah. refugees are looking for a better life, and that's, that's basically the, the crux of, of the comment there. Yes, if we got into, um, treatment and reasons why they were moving, that it would certainly be different. Okay, so by 1803, if you look at the number of states, so Vermont comes in at 1791. When was this country started with George Washington as the first president? Yes! <laughs> okay, 1791, 1789. So Kentucky comes in at 1792. Tennessee comes in in 1796, and Ohio comes in in 1803. All right, so remember Ohio, remember um, Harrison, okay? And Ohio, and Illinois, and how these things are... Uh, are changing really what's happening with this westward expansion you're going to start seeing okay um, a lot more states so you have Indiana in 1816 Mississippi 1817 Illinois 1818 Alabama in 1819 Maine in 1820 and Missouri in 1821 and remember the reason for Maine and Missouri right What's the, what's the catalyst for Maine and Missouri? One was a slave state, one was a free state, but what was the major legislation that dealt with Maine and Missouri? Called what? Oh, you guys have to remember something. Come on. What was a major piece of legislation that went with Maine and Missouri? Yes, the Missouri Compromise. Thank you. Missouri Compromise. Were people happy with the Missouri Compromise? Many people were extremely unhappy with the Missouri Compromise, but it kept the nation together and it helped settle some of the um, issues. It was seen as a southern uh, win, I guess, but in the northern states, there was no more, there were no more slave states being allowed in the Louisiana Purchase. Okay? So, the migrants that were coming in were, had their own um, values and customs, and they brought those with them. Do migrants normally bring their own values and customs with them? Oh, yeah. There you go. Okay. Would you agree, Emmanuel? If they didn't, we wouldn't have the West we do now. Mm -hmm. Very good. You're right. They often do. Okay, the New England uh, migrants were <clears throat> proponents of schools. Okay, they formed towns. They were the majority of them were anti-slavery. Okay, but then you have the southern, the upland southerners who were called the butternuts. And they were called the butternuts because of their homespun clothing, but they brought with them corn and hogs, they built a lot of log cabins, and they were, in general, pro-slavery. Okay? So can you see where you might get some tension between these two groups? Yeah? You could definitely, you could definitely see some of these, um, but what brought them together is that all of them were craving sociability, okay? They were isolated in this big expanse of the West, 
Okay. And so they would get together and they would do, um, they would have like dances and corn huskings and sewing uh, circles. And they in general helped each other out. But as they helped each other out, they would help each other to the everyone else's stuff, right? And so if you had something that somebody else could use, like a broom, uh, they might walk in your house and take your broom. I mean, that was just what people did. Uh, and they you, at, sometimes they still do it. Yes, they do. <laughs> okay. My grandmother, when she came to Alaska in 1934, said that she had a a broom, okay, and she swept her uh, her tent because she was in the tent city in Matanuska. She swept her tent, and then somebody saw the broom. By the time she got the broom back, there were no more bristles, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, and so, you know, it it wasn't just during this time period, but that's what people did, all right, and they really did held uh, these so-called aristocrats in, in high disdain and they uh, they didn't want to be seen as aristocrats okay they wanted to be these honest Democrats they they wanted to be independent kind of like Alaskans right kind of like Westerners so you see this and it's it's like a new culture right that's being created pretensions really didn't get you very far okay and you'll see this it, it actually grows and becomes a larger part of the society the further west you go it's really kind of interesting okay so the far west was past the mississippi river all right and you had some people headed out there you had uh like john jacob astor who went fur trading out on the columbia river in oregon Right. So in the 1820s and 30s, basically the far west had mainly fur traders. Not many other people went out. Okay. And they were considered mountain men. And they gained a, a reputation for being mountain men. Right. So the federal government in the west, the federal government's really seen as one of the causes of the expansion in the west. Why would they be seen as a cause for expansion? How did they create expansion? Well, eventually railroads. Eventually railroads? And canals. And canals? Okay. But how about these things listed here? Land Ordinance, the Northwest, or Northwest Ordinance, the Louisiana Purchase, Transcontinental, oh, I can't even talk today, Transcontinental Treaty, and National Road. Did any of these cause expansion? Dramatic. Dramatic <gasps> expansion. Okay. Yes. Land to veterans, okay? And this isn't new on the North American continent either, is it? No, because it had been done earlier. It had been done in uh, Canada, right? And it had been done by Britain. Land to the soldiers. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the land ordinance, remember, talked or prepared for the survey and the sale of lands. Northwest Ordinance did what? Mm, not quite. It was in 1787. What did it allow Society to build in the West? Yes, but in the form of what? Government. 
think boundaries. States. Yes. How to create states. Okay. Oh, is that where the digit it all out from all these shows all the different states that they play in? Um this one outlines how you can become a state. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> the Louisiana Purchase in 1803 meant the entire Mississippi River was now under U.S. control, which meant that, hey, we have a way to get our, um, our farm supplies to market. It meant that you had, um, you had more land, Hello, twice as much land, right? But you had, it, it was not just a land benefit, it was an economic benefit. Okay, the Transcontinental Treaty. <laughs> yes, thank you, Savannah. Yes, so it wiped out the last of the Spanish uh, power east of the Mississippi River. Very good. Okay, now the National Road. If you're lucky enough to drive in Pennsylvania in certain places, you can drive on the National Road. Yes. Okay, it started in Cumberland, Maryland, and um, on the Potomac River, across the Allegheny Mountains and southwestern Pennsylvania, went to Wheeling, Virginia, which is now Wheeling, West Virginia, okay, on the Ohio River. All right, they were going to continue to St. Louis and to Jefferson City, Missouri, but they ran out um, and construction stopped in Vidalia, Vandalia, Illinois, okay, in 1839. So it started in 1811. It was about uh, 620 miles long, okay? But, so you, now you're connecting rivers, and rivers are important for what? Trade. Trade, very good. Shipping, transportation, right? But now you have a road that you could actually follow, and it's it's better than a trail. It's it's not great. I'm telling you, it's, it's not paved. It's not it's not a Roman road, okay? But it's it's a road, and you can travel. Okay? And this is this is really new, and it's co pretty controversial because who paid for it? Huh. Taxpayers. So the taxpayers pay for a national road. It's only going a certain in a certain area. You know, why didn't it go north of that area? Why didn't it go south of that area? Why can we expand in this state, right? Same kind of thing that you see today with the gas line coming through Val to Valdez or the gas line coming through to Soldatna in the Kenai, right? Why doesn't it come here? Because there's an economic benefit there is a demographic benefit, um, you know, all things change with something like a national road. All right, so, uh-oh, <clears throat> we don't want it to change on its own. All right, so, but <clears throat> the, we, we discussed whose land it was, the natives, either had to sell their land, or they were moved off their land, or they were attacked for their land, or people squatted on their land. Um, it was very hard to hold on to land. It was very hard for natives to hold on to their land. It was very hard for whites to hold on to their land. Okay, Because if you didn't live there and you didn't have somebody present, um, people just kind of took it. They squatted on it. Okay, And so um, if you look at this next slide, 
This is Cumberland Gap today, and it, it is impressive. Uh, the geology in this gap is just amazing. Has anyone driven through the Cumberland Gap? No? It's, it's really cool. And this is only one side. This is, um, we are driving toward Western Pennsylvania. So we're looking toward Western Pennsylvania. This is the left side of the highway. Okay. Um, and the right side of the highway is exactly the same. So it's just this sweeping, uh, geological formation of, uh, of these layers uh, it's just it's fascinating to drive through it's really cool and you can get out and walk there we're on a boardwalk here as we stopped okay and then uh, here is one of the national road mile markers this is actually in a museum at Fort Necessity because Fort Necessity is basically on the national road okay so 79 miles to Wheeling, to Uniontown, to 11. All right. So they have a couple of these. There are actually a couple of them still along the highway that you drive. Um, but a lot of them they've taken out. And interestingly enough, when you go to Uniontown, we stopped in Uniontown and talked to a few folks. And you can still find the original survey markers from George Washington in this region, which is super cool, right? I mean, <laughs> and of course they don't advertise it. This guy said, nah, we don't, we don't advertise it. We just kind of know, it's the local knowledge, right? We just kind of know where these things are. Um, but I was like, really? Could, could you tell me where one is? I'd, I'd really like to go see it. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. I, I didn't ask, I refrained from asking. All right, so the next slide is the National Road looking back toward Cumberland Gap, okay? It's obviously a highway now, but if you're looking at it, you're on the top of this, well, almost to the top of this hill. To your right, just a couple hundred yards down the hill is the meadow where Fort Necessity sits, okay? It's really, really cool. And I actually got it with no cars in the picture. And then this is looking the other direction toward Uniontown and Wheeling. Okay. So, you know, I mean, people, some of these people had these monuments, those, those mile markers still in their, in their front yard, which I thought was really cool. It sure does. And this is the Washington Tavern, and this is sitting, in that picture that I took of looking toward Wheeling, or actually where I was standing, okay? If you turn around, this is the Washington Tavern that's right where I was standing, okay? So Washington Tavern was built in the 1830s. It's literally on the hill overlooking Fort Necessity on the National Road. It's currently part of Fort Necessity Park, and so you can go and tour inside. Really cool um, to see some of the things inside. All right, any questions? No? Okay, so westward expansion, the removal of the Indians. In order to continue moving westward, you're going to have to remove some of the Indians. Right? Unless you're going to camp on top of them. And that didn't go over very well, did it? No. What's that? Except with the Spanish. In what way? They, yeah, they integrated a little bit more. They integrated the two cultures together um, much more so than the British, for sure. Yes. Okay, so... You have the removal of the Indians. Well, how are you going to get rid of them? How are you going to move them? Where are you going to move them? Move them west. Ah, move them west. Yes, because you've already taken the east. Right? So, are you going to trade land? Are you going to buy land? Hmm. Okay, so you have the five civilized tribes. And there are the Cherokees, 
the Choctaws, the Creeks, the Chickasaws, and the Seminoles. Okay? And they're in Southwest, the Old Southwest. And some of them, some of the five recognized tribes, civilized tribes, excuse me, are um, really integrated into white society. Okay? They've intermarried, they have they have their own newspaper. They have done a lot of different. They're in. Uh, they're merchants, and so they buy and sell from from the settlers. Okay, but they're sitting on prime land, especially in Georgia. Okay, and in the South, as well as in the North, that land is prime land, and so. You know, if somebody's sitting on prime land and you want it, what are you going to do? Kick them, off or buy it. Kick them off or buy it. Okay. Uh, you can you can do a lot of different things. Now, the five civilized tribes. One of the reasons they uh, were successful in in their culture is because they were able to to kind of hold on to some of their culture, but also. Um, the northern missionaries or the, the people from the north really saw them more as civilized because of the integration, but the people from the south didn't necessarily uh, treat them or view them in the same way. All right? <clears throat> A lot of it probably is because they lived on the land that the southerners wanted. Now, the southerners may have called some of the northern tribes civilized in um, in retrospect, right? Okay. So you have quite a few different things that the civilized tribes tried to enact and tried to do in order to hold on to their land. Okay. So going back at James Monroe and John Quincy Adams, they signed quite a few or several treaties with tribes talking about the voluntary removal to western lands. Okay, so the states were surveying lands. There were settlers squatting on lands. The um, the southern legislatures were taking lands. They like sold the house out from underneath the the chief, right? They was that, um, Black Hawk or was that... It it wasn't Black Hawk. It was uh oh what was who was that? I don't remember his name right, right off the top of my head. But he was he was a major chief, and they just it was his his land that they gave away in the lottery. And at this point, weren't half of the chiefs like mixed blood? Were they all from the same tribe? There were quite a few, but there were some who were not, and those who were not generally were the ones who did not want. To sell, and so the um, the ones who were, you know, half um, half native or you know, a partial, um, I don't know, interracial, they often were the ones that the whites had signed the treaties. Well, they would sign a treaty and get some money. But the rest of the tribes, white or not white, interracial or non interracial, were angry. Okay, because they had no right to sell the land. Remember, land is held in common. You can't sell it in in many of the native cultures. Alright? And to to have one of your own sell land and then you're told you have to leave um, made some people angry. Put it a, a lightly, right? Okay, so <clears throat> state jurisdic jurisdiction was seen as uh, as more important and trumped tribal governments, and so states were starting to take over um, all of the land and everything else. So you had, like, in eighteen twenty three, Johnson's versus um, McIntosh, which was Supreme Court, 
It held that private citizens could not buy land directly from Native Americans. Okay, and why is that? Because Native Americans, and here's a quote, as an inferior race of people without the privilege of citizens and under the perpetual protection and pupillage of the government. Okay, so um, they are not um, responsible for their lands. The Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. All right. Chief Justice John Marshall wrote that the let relationship of the tribes to the United States government resembles that of a ward to its guardian. So the United States government is going to become the, the guardian of the tribes in the land. Okay. This is how you see land today. Uh, we don't have, it's, it's not exact, but it's setting the precedence for this. Okay. Because native allotments and native land on reservations is held in trust by the U.S. government. If you are a native with a native allotment, you cannot sell your land until you go through the Bureau of Indian Affairs and get permission to sell it, even though you own it. You don't really own it because it's held in trust. Okay? And one of the reasons is because so many people were getting cheated out of money. They were selling it, <clears throat> not so much here, but they were selling it for, you know, a few bottles of, of alcohol in a lot of cases, especially the further west. Wait, so is that true up here too? Yes. It's all over the United States. The native allotments here in Alaska are held in trust by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So if they are selling their allotment, they've gone through a lengthy and when I say lengthy, it is lengthy process of having it approved for sale. So is that like native private land or like cotton? Different. Native allotments are up to 160 acres by an individual. Otna land is held by Otna. However, there is a Supreme Court, there is a court case right now uh, that is claiming that and is going after a loophole in Anilka and Anxa regarding trusteeship about native land. Anilka and Anxa, Anxa was passed so that natives would hold all title to the land. And there's a, a court case saying that it's still held in trust, which could change much land status in Alaska, pretty much everything. What would happen? Mm. That's a, that is a question that we're going to talk about when we get to Anxa and Anilka. Um, but there are so many ramifications from that that you can't, you can't really delve into that in chapter 9. <laughs> okay? But that's a great question. And uh, we will we'll talk about that when we get to that area. Okay, so the Indian Removal Act. You have Andrew Jackson, President Andrew Jackson. President Andrew Jackson is friendly or unfriendly toward Indians. What do you think, Valdez? A little, yeah, a little bit. Just a smidge. Yeah, just a smidge. <laughs> okay, so the Indian Removal Act <coughs> was a, to exchange lands for western lands, okay? A hundred million acres given in the southwest for 32 million acres given past the Mississippi River, all right? And... The Worcester versus Georgia is when the Supreme Court ruled that the Cherokee Nation was actually a distinct community with all with self-government in which the laws of Georgia can have no force. Okay, so now the Supreme Court is saying, okay, they're wards and the states can't come in and claim their territory. Andrew Jackson says, I don't care what you say. 
you're sitting in Washington, D.C., you're not going to fight me. I won the Battle of New Orleans, <laughs> and too bad. We're going to do what we want to do. Um, he chose to ignore a Supreme Court ruling. Okay? The Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears made, uh, it facilitated the Trail of Tears. The federal government did. So, no. They let the state government, he and Andrew Jackson allowed the state governments to continue to, um, to claim the native land in the Old Southwest. And he also uh, had, or they facilitated the Treaty of New, New Ecota, which <clears throat> was signed uh, by some lesser Cherokee chiefs, which meant that the Cherokees were then moved, uh, the, the, you know, the five civilized tribes, tribes, they were moved to Oklahoma from Georgia and Florida and um, it's when a third of the Cherokee Nation died on the on the journey. Okay, it was dramatic. Uh, I don't have those figures. I don't have those figures. It's really hard to get good figures, um, but we can look for them. I can look for them next time. But you know, you, you see this, and you see. Okay, X tribe has, it loses 10%, loses 20%, loses 50%, loses a third, right? So you just see this continual decline in, in the populations, okay? All right, so in the Northwest Territory, Black Hawk, all right, is when they were fighting, they were actually almost annihilated in 1832. And between 1832 and 37, 190 million acres in the Northwest was traded for $70 million in, um, in grants and annual gifts, which is about 41 cents an acre. Okay? All right. Any questions? Well, wait till we get a few slides down and you see how much they sell it for. No, no, not a thousand for an acre, but wait till we get there. Okay, so you can see the removal, you can see the, the Trail of Tears and the other removals. Um, these were not easy journeys, okay? A lot of them overland, you lost the elderly which were the, the keepers of your culture, right? You lost the children who were bringing up the culture. Um, you lost anybody who was infirm. You lost warriors who had, had fought and maybe were hurt, right? Um, so you, you were losing quite a few um, people in this journey. I mean, you, you lost everyone, but you know, every, anything like this always, um, affects the the elderly and the younger more so than the others. The majority on the reservations? Um, you know, Savannah, you can see, just wait, because this land, the Indian Territory here, also gets decreased and the people keep getting moved further west, okay? And the western tribes who are there already also keep getting further, moved further west, and their lands are smaller. However, if you look at a, if you look at a map, imagine a map. On the east coast, you might have dot, dot, dot for native land on the coast. The further west you get, the larger the parcels are, okay? So you'll see you'll see parcels of land, you'll see um, reservations here, but even further west, you'll see larger ones. 
like the Navajo Nation is probably it's it's big in Arizona by the Gila River okay so land ceded to the government for the reservations and and remember the reason that they're moving them to the to the west of the Mississippi is they didn't think the land was very valuable All right, so you've also got a westward, westward expansion agricultural boom going on after the War of 1812. So you have rising prices in corn and wheat, um, which meant that farm prices were raised, right, rising. Okay, You have France and Britain who's buying supplies from you because they're worn out after so many years of fighting. Okay, Their farms haven't done well. You have a market for goods in the industrial areas and the urbanized areas. <clears throat> so the government policies were helping open the West just as these farm prices started to rise. And so it was a great incentive for people to move out because you could actually make some money. Right? Okay? A better life. Right? You're looking for a better situation for yourself and your family pretty much a, a universal norm that you're looking for. Right? So in the Northwest, they were known as uh, wheat and, and corn, and in the Southwest, cotton. Okay, so the cotton gin changed a lot of things because the production, okay, the yield of raw cotton doubled each decade after the 1800s because of the cotton gin. But also with the, okay, so you've got the cotton gin, you've got increased yields, but increased yields means you need more, more um, farm hands. More farm hands mean more, more slaves, right? So for everything that's done, you have all of these things that follow, right? Where's the In the early 1800s, I'd have to look it up, Brian. I don't, I don't remember, because we we get into that further. This book is kind of compartmentalized in a lot of ways, so there were some. I I would have to look it up again. Okay, so, um, tobacco fell in value, but rice exports were good. Um, sugar became to, began to thrive, but only in Louisiana. You had, um, by mid-century, the America was growing three quarters of the cotton that was uh, the world's supply of cotton. Okay, so that's a huge boom. I mean, that's an economic power, powerhouse, right? All right, and here is another little gem. This is the patent, actually, for the cotton gin in 1794. All right, so um, the growth of the market economy. You've got a market economy, which means that people had enough crops that they could sell their extra crops for cash. Okay, it wasn't just subsistence. Remember, in New England, prior to this, they were growing enough to um, to feed their families, okay? But you're starting to see more of, you, you started to see it in the 1700s where the, they had a little bit, but now you have an economy of scale, okay? So more people and more states are able to use this as um, selling crops for cash, okay? At, but one of the things that came from that is that slaves became more valuable. And it forced farmers into debt because farmers often didn't have the cash to buy all the seed, all of the uh, farming implements, the farm, <clears throat> and wait for their cash crop. Right? So you see this debt coming in. They, so they also had to borrow money for the land. So you have uh, the federal land policy that's actually helping this market economy. You've got um, 
you have them coming in and they're selling, surveying, okay? The, in 1785, with the ordinance of 1785, they were selling and they were surveying townships, okay? Remember townships, right? Huge parcels of land, 640 acres, okay? And then they divide it up into, um, down even further, okay? They were selling it for $2 an acre. If they bought it at 41 cents an acre, what kind of a profit was that? That was an enormous profit. Yes. Okay. So not only was this from uh, from natives, but they also had all this land that was ceded by these other states who had claimed it um, after the revolution. Right. Remember how they ceded the land. Okay. So they were creating this public domain that could be sold. And this is one of the ways that they were going to finance the, the federal government. And <clears throat> so the Federalists started supporting, um, they really supported selling to wealthy investors who were speculators. And then you had um, speculators who were supposed to sell to the par farmers. <clears throat> but they dropped the acreage to 320 acres, so half, and still at $2 an acre. And then they had to drop it to 40 acres for $1.25 an acre. Okay? Still making an enormous profit out of 41 cents an acre for the native lands that they actually bought. As some of the lands they bought for 41 cents. <laughs> some of the lands were, were even less. Okay? So <clears throat> the public domain lands were selling, but they sold higher at auctions, which makes sense because you have speculators at auctions who can come and drive the bidding up. But the squatters said, we're not going to let you do that. The squatters came and said, who are squatters? Well, what do squatters do? Right. They go in and use the land. There's nothing official with it. They, um, they start farming. And then the federal government says, well, you can't do that. And they said, well, we did. Um, what are you going to do about it? So they ended up with some of the title to it. But the squatters also tried to control the speculators because if the speculators drove up the land too high, then nobody could get it. Right? And so <clears throat> the, um, the credit was available through the Second Bank of the United States and private banks. And so this financed the speculators. So I've got a little exercise here. So Savannah here is going to be the banker. You're going to be a state bank. I am the Bank of the United States. You are going to give each one of these farmers a loan. Go we'll give them a loan. <laughs> you don't like where this is going? Okay. So, um, the farmers hit 18, 19, and they can't sell anything. Okay? You hit a deep recession in 1819, the panic of 1819. Everybody says, whoa, whoa, we want our money back. So whoever gets to Savannah first gets the specie, which is the gold or silver that she has that you can claim. So you better hurry because somebody's going to lose out. Huh. Okay. So Ryan and Garrick got there first. Brianna and Aiden, what happens to them? Aha. Uh -huh. So you come to the federal bank, what happens? So? Okay, you want something and you want something. You get something. Okay? You get the gold and the silver. But I 
you Savannah, I hold the debt on Savannah. So she owes me now. And I am bigger and meaner than you are. You're a piddly little state bank. I am backed by the federal government. You owe me money. You collect. Collect. Collect on the money. To the conference. Okay. Who can pay Savannah? I have no money. Exactly. <laughs> you have no money. Exactly. So Savannah, can you pay me back? Nobody I here has. I stole you. Yeah, you, st you stole. You stole one. <laughs> All right, so you need to pay me back one. But what happened? <laughs> okay, so so do you understand what's happening here? So me as the bank get stuck with the loan that they gave out. It'd be like because they have loose bank practices and they let they lend money to the speculators who and to the farmers who, they lend who money probably that they shouldn't have gotten have. money. Well, didn't the bank? Load it from the federal government and then give it to them. Is that what happened? Some yes, the fe the the federal government bank will often give loans to the state banks, but you printed more money than you could supply back. The you printed more money than you had gold in your account. So because you printed more money, they all lost because they come to me. And I pay them, but then I hold a, I hold you accountable. And you try to collect from them, and you collected one out of four. So I did buy a person. Exactly, exactly, and that's what happened. People would hide. People would. Um, I mean, what are you going to do? You have it's nothing. Bank account. <laughs> you have nothing, right? You're a farmer. You have crops, so they take your so farming implements and you. Oh, and and that would be great, <laughs> wouldn't it? Okay. All that's right. Cost for another revolution. Oh, cause for another revolution. Okay, so does that kind of demonstrate what's going on? All right. So the speculators were losing out because the price of land just plummeted because nobody could pay their debts, and so nobody could buy any more land. So the people who had driven the price up. And bought land at a high price, thinking they were going to sell it for a higher price, lost. Okay, along with all the farmers in this room. Which is why you don't pay yourself a pension when you buy it. If you have the cash, but what farmer has a lot of cash? This is why these Alaskans. farmers. What's that? Alaskans. <laughs> Alaskans have cash in October. <laughs> Right? Okay, so um, we also, you are charging, well, maybe not the banks, the banks aren't charging, but speculators would charge like up to 40% interest. That's pretty spendy. Yeah. Um, I used to be a loan shark in my other life, and in Alaska it's legal to charge 36% interest on small loans, personal loans. You know what that equates to? That's a lot of money. It is a dollar. Yes. It is. It's it's spending. Okay? Louisiana, 48%. So, um, it, was, it was just driving this, this economy, and the economy just crashed. Okay? But uh, you have people who keep move, then moving west okay so you use land for a while you keep moving west keep moving west keep moving west which creates more issues with the uh, the natives okay so that was a panic of 1819 thank you for all participating in the panic of 1819 <laughs> The transportation, steamboats, canals, and railroads, <clears throat> they become extremely important at this time. 
you have some uh, monopolies. Gibbons versus Ogden, a monopoly there on the Hudson River. Hudson River between New York City and New Jersey. Uh, one of Well, why couldn't you? It was a new country. You could do whatever you wanted, couldn't you? States' rights. States' rights. So navigable rivers weren't really an issue. Um, the United States stepped in and said, uh, you can't, <coughs> the state can't regulate this interstate trade. Okay? And so then this monopoly was broken. You had these other people who were um, coming in with steamboats and using the river and were able to, uh, you know, drop the prices. If you have competition, it drops the price, right? Generally, it's the way competition is normally, normally is supposed to work. Okay. But you have things like the Erie Canal being built, which is the eighth wonder of the world. It's a phenomenal feat of engineering. It started the canal boom in the 1820s and 30s, and it reduced shipping costs from 20 to 30 cents a, a ton per mile to only 2 to 3 cents a ton a mile. Right? So shipping costs are, are changed dramatically. You have railroads starting to be built. You have um, railroads, and we're going to talk about railroads because the further into history we get, the more important they become. And by 1840, there were 3,000 miles of track laid in the United States. Okay. By the 1830s, railroad investment exceeded canal investment. Um, Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt as of, as in, um, one of the richest people in America, in one night decided he was going to sell all his ships and go to railroads, okay? And he made, I don't know, billions in today, you know? Vanderbilt? I don't remember. I don't remember. Um, yeah. No, he wasn't, he wasn't broke, and the Vanderbilt family is still seen as a very wealthy family. Um, you know, the railroads ebbed and later, uh, but railroads are extremely lucrative. <clears throat> and so, okay, um, Robin has dropped off. Hold on, let me write back to Robin here. I just got back in right now. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Luckily, all this is recorded, so you can go back if you need to. So. I know, I appreciate that. So. Yeah. The freight revenues exceeded passenger revenues by 1849, and by 1850, the East Coast had a link to the Great Lakes. And this is significant because you have the American Manufacturing Belt located on the Great Lakes. Okay? You've got this American Manufacturing Belt being built right there on the Great Lakes. And you have transportation to get it there, besides the Erie Canal. Okay? Erie Canal, <clears throat> the canals were a huge boom, and then railroads just blew by them. All right? Um, still at this time, it was cheaper to ship bulking canals, but uh, very soon you will see railroads blowing by. All right, so you have major rivers, roads, and canals. And there is your national road. Okay, remember it goes east-west. And your coastal road goes north-south. All right. We still have a coastal road. Well, we still have the the national road, too. I want to say it was like 40. I don't remember the number of it. I forget. Um, 
but 95 goes north-south and follows pretty closely to where the the coastal road is or at least a general general region okay growth of cities you hit you've had this urbanization because transportation speeded it up right because you needed more people in the cities to uh, take care of the shipping to you know build in the manufacturing plants right so between 1820 and 1860 it was the most rapid urbanization in American history we are still a rural nation however the majority of people still live in rural areas okay but the transportation revolution shifted the economies and the economy started um, growing more in the cities than anywhere else. Okay? But you've got the canals who shifted the economy toward the Great Lakes. And the population now are from the river cities to the lake cities, which are becoming more important because they're along that American manufacturing belt. Okay, so you see this population distribution? Look how fast this has happened. In six, this is 60 years. Seriously. 60 years. Yeah. Okay, and look at the urban population. And how concentrated some of that population has become. Okay, and look at these um, these cities. Look at New York. Look how big New York is now, and Boston is twenty five thousand to fifty thousand. But between eighteen twenty and eighteen sixty, New York City is sitting at between a hundred and two hundred and fifty thousand. Okay, um, in eighteen twenty, Anchorage has two hundred and sixty thousand, or maybe two hundred and seventy thousand now in 2015. Some significant changes there. And look at the changes in the um, in the cities and where you see that they're spreading out, but you see the beginning of what we now call the megalopolis on the eastern seaboard. Okay? So today, from Washington, D.C. all the way to Boston, they call it a megalopolis because it's majority city. The entire way. Okay, so the industrialization, we were about a generation behind England because England wouldn't let the skilled labor leave. But because of the Embargo Act of 1807, we have more money to start manufacturing. Remember how I mentioned that last class? Okay, so we have this industrialization, these, especially near the city of no Boston. Boston, thank you. Yes, Boston, because he was one of the biggest losers from the embargo, right? Remember? Because a good chunk of their economy came from the shipping. Remember? Okay, so textile towns in New England, Lowell, Massachusetts, one of the premier textile towns. All right, so <clears throat> you have cotton, you have a, not a glut of cotton, but you have cotton that is supplying the world, right? So what are you going to do with it? So you're going to build a mill to use the cotton. So, textiles, it's a natural fit, right? So, <clears throat> they had textile mills in England, but you couldn't go there. And so, you had Slater 
go to England, pretend that he was on vacation, go visit these mills, go back to the hotel room and every night draw detailed maps of the mills, came back to the United States and built one. Okay? And from that, it exploded. Okay? Lowell, Massachusetts ended up being the second large, having the second largest population in Massachusetts behind Boston. <laughs> and Lowell is, again, is probably an hour from Boston. Um, it was the first planned industrial city in America. And it was founded in 1821 and 1822 specifically to um, create this industry. All right? And so they recruited women and girls. I mean, they were young kids, kids, you know, six, seven, eight. And they recruited them off the farms. The women left the farms because they thought they could do better in the mill. Okay, they had an opportunity to get out, All right? And so <clears throat> they would go and work in these mills. The mills were really uh, strict in dealing with the, the girls. They required them to attend church. They had to live in their housing. They could only do certain things. Um, they had to show up for work at X, X uh, hour. And they, they changed the system from working on a farm, which you get up with the sun, you work, um, but you can set your own, you really can set your own agenda, right? You work in a mill and you no longer set your own agenda, you will work by the clock. And so this was a, a psychological and philosophical shift, okay, that changed and such a dramatic shift, a, a philosophical shift, um, changes not just that person, but changes society in ways that they never expected. Because it was easier con to control. Savannah asked why they regimented it so much. And in order for them to lure, not lure, but attract girls and women, and the families to allow the girls and women to come to Lowell and work, they said, this is what we do, and your girls will be safe, okay? Your girls will be taken care of. And it, it's important to know, and also to know that your daughters are going to have an opportunity to, um, you know, not get into trouble. that make sense? Okay, so <clears throat> it was by 1850 that Lowell became the second largest population in Massachusetts. They employed more than 10,000 uh, women and girls, okay? They had 33,000 people there. And another shift that was changing is because these, they were focusing on girls, they were, um, hiring single people now, not families. Families, remember it was the family units that were moving out west for a new opportunity. This is a new opportunity as a single person and as a woman who had, they had very few opportunities. At this time, the women were going to work until they got married, okay? Later on and not, not long after this, the immigrants who are coming in who who kind of take over for the Lowell girls, the mill girls, um, they're coming over singly, but they're going to be working continually until they're done in these, in these mills. They're not expecting to marry and leave. Okay? So things are changing so rapidly that it's, um, the society is just in constant flux. All right, any questions? All right, and extremely harsh environments. The, the work here was, was very harsh. I'm going to show these pictures until we get cut off, and we'll start again from here. So we'll do, we'll finish 9 and do 10 um, next class.
Okay, so these are the market mills in Lowell, and you can walk through these. These are, there was a courtyard here. These were formerly the Lowell mills. Here are some reenactors in Lowell. So the man who works uh, shoveling coal is on the left. Uh, the man who owns a mill is in the middle. And then you have a current resident. So it's, it's another cultural uh, historic site. All right, and here you have a cobblestone city street in Lowell. Remember, these are all planned cities, specifically for industry. This is Shattuck Street. The old city hall is at the end of this street. Okay, here is the Boot Cotton Mill on the Eastern Canal. And it's really cool because you can still use these canals in certain places. Here is the Boot Cotton Mills, uh, one of the historic photos, okay? And then you have the same thing today. Oh, they build with brick on the east, in the east all the time. You don't see a lot of brick in Alaska because it's cold. The and it's, the ground shifts, and it's very hard to get it up here. It's very expensive. So, okay, we got cut off. We'll start here again on Tuesday.